Welcome back to CFO Weekly, where we're talking with financial leaders about how to build efficiency in their teams, create time for strategy, and ultimately get results with your host, Megan Weiss. Let's jump right in. Today, my guest is John Collins, CFO live person. Drawing on his experience as a founder, data scientist, and institutional investor, John Collins brings a modern vision and skill set to the role of CFO. Before his appointment to CFO, John led the development of automations and machine learning to support strategic decision-making and predictive analytics as LivePerson's SVP of quantitative strategy. Prior to LivePerson, John pioneered approaches for transforming third-party data exhaust into investment signals as co-founder and chief product officer of Thassos. John also served as portfolio manager for a systematic equity strategy while Thassos incubated inside an NYC-based fund with over $10 billion in assets under management. John's previous financial services experience includes closing over $3 billion in transactions at Credit Suisse and building an automated equity surveillance system to detect suspicious trading activity at the New York Stock Exchange. John holds an MBA from MIT Sloan School of Management, a JD from Chicago Kent College of Law, and a BS from the University of Central Florida. Hello, John, and thank you for joining me today. Hi, Megan. Thank you for having me. Today, we'll be talking about your background, your experience as a CFO, and a bit about your organization, LivePerson, and how they're using artificial intelligence to optimize brand-to-consumer conversations. We'll also be talking about the importance of AI and automation in finance and accounting and how it's enabling the profession to evolve. John, I'm really looking forward to this discussion, so let's get started. Your background is perhaps unique to many CFOs these days, but likely becoming more common. So tell me about your career progression and how you got to where you are today. Sure. I'm really a mix of entrepreneur, finance professional, data scientist by both training and experience. I started my career in finance at the New York Stock Exchange, where I led teams that built automated surveillance systems to detect manipulative and anomalous activity among the exchange's terabytes of incoming order flow. I also led teams in related tasks to investigate that kind of activity, conduct compliance exams, and actually was an advisor to the SEC on algorithmic market manipulation for a number of years. After the NYSE, I spent two years in grad school at MIT, and my experience at the NYSE got me interested in the buy side, and I kind of manifested that interest along with an interest in in writing code and kind of learning more about machine learning and the math that underpins it. That kind of manifested in, in a project that I took on in my own time to build a trading platform, a fully automated trading platform that actually made trades for me successfully while I was pursuing my MBA at at MIT. And I had some luck in that endeavor that translated into a role as a portfolio manager for a fund with over 10 billion in AUM. And my strategies there were were fully systematic and and data-driven in the sense you you might expect. I also co-founded a company in what I'll call the data as a service space or insights as a service. We served the finance world in addition to commercial real estate and even corporates, providing them with insight for how to optimize business decisions. For example, in the case of brick and mortar retailers, where would you put a new location given who's passing by on the street or, or by car or the you know what other businesses and, and their customer profiles are located in the vicinity? So data as a service, insights as a service help with, with a wide range of business problems in addition to providing alpha signals for investing in the marketplace. I met the CEO of LivePerson by chance, actually, when a recruiter pitched me the company's data instead of the role. I hadn't even heard of LivePerson at the time. And I found the data super compelling. And and I'd love to talk more about that if the, the conversation goes there. And ultimately took a meeting because I thought I could trade the data. But the vision that was communicated to me was so compelling on both a personal and a professional level that I eventually signed on to put sort of my experience and skills to use for and kind of transforming live person's vision into, uh, into reality. And so I didn't start as a CFO, but I started in a related capacity in my view that, that eventually led naturally into the CFO role. 
so that's uh, that's how I got here today. Sounds like you've had a very interesting and successful career to date. So are there any particular stories or moves that stand out throughout your career? Yeah, I, I guess I would maybe double click on some of what I just described. One, I think founding and, and leading a company is excellent preparation for any business endeavor. I think setting vision, building teams, fundraising, managing the PL, building products, selling to customers, understanding customer needs, you know, putting all of that together is, is essentially what an entrepreneur needs to do to be successful. And after enough of that, I think that it translates into a skill set that's highly desired in a CFO or in a COO or in a CEO in a wide range of, of capacities. And I think that any of those roles, the CFO role in particular, should be able to bring those types of skills and experiences to the table because ultimately the, the CFO should be a, a partner in the creation of long-term value, a, a strategic partner for decision-making on the go-to-market side and the product development side with regard to how to allocate capital. And I think those kinds of experiences that I had in, in founding a company and I ran it for over seven years were incredibly helpful for getting me to where I am today. But I would say that perhaps the most pivotal move, for me anyway, happened even before founding a company. I would say teaching myself to, to write code for practical applications, learning the, the math and statistics that's at the foundation of what today is considered more classical machine learning, that really radically altered my career trajectory. And that's a career trajectory, by the way, that began with law school. So pretty big turn in, in that respect. And as I described a moment ago, I mean, I, I use that knowledge and, and skills to really go very deep in, in finance, particularly quantitative finance, leveraging data to derive investment signals, again, in the form of a fully automated trading platform that, that eventually you led to a PM role, portfolio manager role with uh, a small amount of founder, founders capital that, that eventually grew to over 100 million in institutional capital. So those are what I would say is stories or, or pivotal turning points in, in my career. And you touched on it a bit with the idea of a strategic partner, but how do you think that the role of CFO is evolving? I think it's pretty clear, especially after 2020, that one, we've been digitizing the world and like everyone across all countries, you know, in, in, the, in a global context, we as a society, human race has been digitizing the world at an accelerating pace. And I think that has implications for traditional products and services, as well as traditional jobs and corporate functions. For example, today within live person, even we have automated data capture teams that are parsing our calendars, our emails, our text messages, our voice calls, and machine learning algorithms classify and structure that data in real time for downstream consumption for automations or decision-making. And as a result, I think that our systems understand that, you know, for example, in the context of sales, you know, one customer may think our platform's too expensive and the system can alert management that there's an likely RFP without a salesperson ever really having said a word or, or performing any kind of data entry into to a CRM. And so when you, when you abstract up from that, that world that we're living in today, that accelerated pace of digitization, I think that it's not too difficult to see that the CFO in particular operates at the intersection of all of the company's data flows, sales, product usage, finance, HR, benefits, and even considering only traditional data from these domains, that's a, that's a vast amount of data to handle, let alone extract useful information from. And so fundamentally, I think that the CFO's job is to transform that data. And historically, it's been focused more on sales and, and financial type data, but I think it's far broader than that. Fundamentally, the role is to transform that data into useful information for strategic decision making. And in our increasingly quantified world, as I've described, and I think that that to quantify increasing, I think it was literally exponential in, in during the pandemic, you know, optimizing for, you know, competing in that world requires us to optimize for like that last 5%, and that last 1% and spreadsheets and the skills of traditional financial analysts are simply not the right tools for the job today. And so from this perspective, I think the role of the CFO has evolved a lot and the tools haven't really kept up with that 
evolution. And so I, from, a, from that perspective, data science skills, solid grounding in, in statistics, and I think a different lens on how to leverage information that lives in, within the organization, within GNA, is needed to continue to add value and, and, and compete. So that's the way I'm thinking about the role and, and how it's evolving. The combination of data and technology is definitely doing amazing things these days. So why do you think your skill set makes you so well suited to be a CFO right now in this day and age? You know, without, without kind of repeating what I described a moment ago, which I think is fundamentally what, what's at the heart of, of the answer, right? The, the, the need to leverage more data, the need to make faster decisions, the need to be more predictive is ever present. And the CFO is at the center of that. The CFO needs to help guide decision-making Again, in a go-to-market context, in a product development context, capital allocation context. And so I think naturally more data, you should leverage it. That, that gives you even greater advantages. But if I make it more specific, I would say CFOs typically are asked to help assess, uh, let's say, the pipeline for, for bookings in, in an enterprise sales context and to build financial plans that are based on that assessment. And now, I, I think we have more tools at our disposal. For example, within, within my organization, we no longer rely on a traditional sales ops team that extracts data from a CRM like Salesforce, puts it in a spreadsheet, and manually sort of computes expectations on, on bookings and risks and opportunities. We now have that fully automated. And we haven't just automated what was done manually in a spreadsheet. We've leveled up the game with machine learning. And so it's now it's fully automated, but in addition to that, it's highly predictive. And so at the very start of the quarter, we know, for example, that where we're gonna land on, in, in terms of bookings within a very tight margin of error, that allows us to assess at a rep level and an opportunity level where we should focus our time and resources to course correct if, if we need to, if we're not on plan, or where we're seeing trends that reveal opportunity that we should pursue and put more resources on. That's fundamentally something CFOs have always done, but they haven't had these tool sets at their disposal to be strategic and predictive at that level. I would say that CFOs are also, you know, always asked to sign off on pricing and, and deal structures, often without a solid quantitative foundation for the underlying unit economics. And, you know, funny that just this morning, in fact, I was, I was asked to sign off on, on pricing for, for a deal that, that was heavily discounted. And we've actually just built out a fully automated system for assessing unit economics at the individual customer level and the product level. And it was clear from this system that this particular proposal would not have had any margin. And so armed with that kind of real-time information, I think that CFOs can be a lot more strategic in partnering with the go-to-market organization to set boundaries and strategies that optimize for, again, long-term value creation, not, not short-term gains like more revenue in the quarter. So, so again, it depends a little bit on what your objective function is. Sometimes more revenue in the quarter and higher growth is what you're valued on and, and, and you should optimize for that. But I think that nonetheless, there's, there's a lot more information that bubbles to the surface now because of the machines we've deployed that allows me and, and more generally other CFOs to be strategic and creative with the information rather than just chasing it down in the first place for, for kind of an ad hoc analysis or an ad hoc answer to a question. So I, I think that that, you know, my experience and my skill set, particularly in the realm of data and finance, that, that intersection has given me, I think, a unique advantage in this evolving role. And let's talk about live person. What is it that they do? Live person provides a cloud-based platform that today that the largest brands in the world use to converse with consumers through messaging. You know, the same preferred medium that you and I use to converse with our friends and our family every day. And, and we call this platform the conversational cloud. And with it, you literally can message in WhatsApp or iMessage to change your flight, to order a burrito, to arrange contactless commerce services like curbside pickup, as was of course very common during the heights of the pandemic. And uh, we think of messaging-based transactions or conversations like these as 
really representing a, a modern engagement model for brands and consumers that we call conversational commerce. And fundamentally, it gives consumers back their time. Because no longer do you need to wait on hold, slot yourself into an agent's schedule in a contact center in order to get simple questions answered. Now you can send a message and be confident that you can go about your day and you'll get an answer in return that's accurate and, and you know you can take care of these sort of transactional needs without again slotting yourself onto the schedule of, of one of these big brands as we've had to do it historically. So today the platform performs a wide range of use cases or enables, I should say, a wide range of use cases beyond just customer service. We handle two-way outbound notifications. So gone are the days of the you know, do not reply at emails. Now, fundamentally, we believe that consumers should converse with their brands. Brands, they should be able to respond and, and, and have a conversation about something that's happening that, that, that affects their service or um, you know, product questions. And it's great for the brands because they can proactively reach back out through this channel to consumers for services and, and product upgrades that, that might be relevant. The platform also handles marketing capabilities, which are related to what I just described, social capabilities, and what's perhaps driving the most value today for us, commerce capabilities. In, in 2020, Consumers leaned in really heavily on digital solutions for nearly every aspect of their lives, you know, from ordering groceries to contactless commerce, as I described. And so brick and mortar retailers and, and e-commerce retailers, that they turned to conversational commerce to really capture that demand. And again, the ability to simply have a conversation and, and inherently as humans, we're conversational. We seek that kind of interaction with our brands and, and being able to get a few simple questions answered can really multiply the revenue that historically we've attributed to traditional you know, advertising and, and marketing channels. The other key component of live person is really the automation. And since 2018, we've invested heavily in artificial intelligence, specifically conversational AI, to automate these types of interactions between brands and consumers at scale. So when I say a consumer asks a question of a brand, it's not always a human to human interaction. It may be a human to machine interaction where the machine can answer many of the questions that, that may come about in relation to a product or a service. And at its root, conversational AI is, is focused on natural language understanding. For example, consider that you, know, you or I could express a desire or a need, which, which we call an intent, such as I want to pay my bill, or I want to change my address, or I want to upgrade my service. And as humans, we often speak in colloquial terms. We have wide ranging dialects, we abbreviate, uh, especially in messaging. And so you can express these intents in practically innumerable ways. And when you multiply that by the number of languages that are commonly spoken around the world, it's clear like th that the observation space is just massive. So for automations to be effective at that at scale, right, in, in this observation space, the underlying AI, natural language understanding, needs to be truly cutting edge. And from this perspective, AI is really live person's true competitive differentiation. And we actually have, have transitioned from care into commerce into actually AI as a service that's driving revenues today. Yeah, as a consumer, that sounds amazing. I think most of us would like to be able to self-serve. Okay, and, and what have you been able to accomplish so far as live person CFO? Yeah, so I, I mentioned earlier that I didn't join the company as CFO. I joined actually as a senior vice president of quantitative strategy. But, but what does that mean? As I described in uh, my first interaction with the company, you know, I was kind of pitched a vision for conversational AI, but also to take that, those AI capabilities that, that are the foundation of our core product line that we compete with directly in the marketplace and turn them inwards on ourselves. That, that is on the finance function, on the accounting function, on the sales operations function, on GNA generally. And I found that really compelling because when I look at big enterprises and their back office functions, they're pretty antiquated. That they have a, a sort of network of disconnected data silos, you know, the typical enterprise systems that don't talk to each other effectively, that are ineffective data repositories, that are hard to extract data from, that require humans like analysts in the back office to perform the equivalent of ETL jobs. That is, they'll extract data from one system, they'll transform it in a spreadsheet, 
you know, normalize the data or combine it with other data and then load it into another system. And they, they have to perform that handoff manually and the handoff completes a workflow. That's just extraordinarily inefficient. And so what Rob and I, Rob being the CEO of LifePerson and Vision was that one, we, we, would, we would deploy a new data management architecture. And two, we would, once we had the data flowing between these systems and, and we deployed models to automate these repetitive tasks, we could elevate our employee base from the mundane repetitive tasks that are so common in the back office to being more creative and strategic with the information that the machines are bubbling to the surface. And ultimately that allows us to optimally leverage human and, and machine intelligence that creates these kind of new dimensions of competitive advantage behind the scenes, just allows us to make faster and smarter decisions that do translate into competitive advantage in the marketplace. And the last piece of the equation here was to, once we kind of built out that framework and we had all of these automations functioning across, again, sales operations and accounting and finance, we then would add a layer, our own core technology, a layer of conversational AI that allows an executive or someone in another department to ask a question in a natural language of a system and get an answer but without having to navigate the, the typical you know, dozens of drop-down menus after sort of putting your credentials into a system that doesn't talk to any other systems to get a single point of information. Instead, you'd speak to the system and get access to data across all systems. And that's, that's a vision that we're executing pretty rapidly on today. So when I first joined the company, I set about that mission predominantly, you know, laying a new architecture for data management and automating low-hanging fruit. And the success that, that I had in, in very early on in those endeavors naturally led to the position that I'm in today. And what advice can you offer other CFOs who are looking to leverage AI in their function? I think that successfully operationalizing data science and machine learning in any domain requires the creation of recurring value. And that sounds kind of intuitive, but the reality is that many data scientists are used for one-off or, or ad hoc projects that might answer a question, but that doesn't drive recurring changes in behavior or change decision-making processes. And at a high level, any project I think worth pursuing should be measurable, reliable, and scalable. And while that, again, sounds somewhat intuitive, it's, I think, surprisingly easy to venture down a rabbit hole that expertly solves, let's say, the wrong problem, or that you may solve a problem too slowly for it to really matter. Or if it's solved, it's solved in a, in a way that doesn't drive change, that isn't communicated effectively to stakeholders. And I think on that latter point, what I've observed in, in my career, not just here, but, but over time, is that cleaning and normalizing data applying the models and, and generating insights is, is kind of only half the battle. The other half is related to change management and you know, changing behavior and driving action. If behavior and decision-making processes don't change, then all of that work doesn't really make an impact. And so to this end, data science should be stakeholder driven. Data science is typically thought of as 60 or 80% data cleaning with the remainder kind of research or science and, and writing code. But I think that it's really critical that interfacing with stakeholders, truly understanding the needs of the business, the why of the problem that you're solving needs to be at least 50% of that equation. And to achieve this, it's important to kind of understand separation of duties within a data science operation. So data engineers are for wrangling data that's fit for research, scientists are for the research and the model building, and engineers are needed for wrapping those models and production quality code and ultimately building, building scalable systems that, that have recurring value. And without that division of labor, you end up with a data scientist that does all of the above and, and you know, never really makes material progress. So I think that's a key lesson that people are learning, but, but might not be common knowledge. And then I would say just finally taking it up a level from there, I found that a, just a deep understanding of the underlying models, their weaknesses, their strengths, along with the feasibility of engineering from a project management perspective and a resource perspective is really critical for setting a realistic vision and a realistic product development roadmap. And it's also critical for leadership of this particular set of, of people and, and their skill sets, the engineers and the scientists who are doing the day-to-day -day work. So in the absence of 
that kind of experience, that kind of understanding, I think it would be really important to add another layer of leadership below the CFO in, in order to effectively operationalize data science and, and AI, as you said. Yeah, that's great advice. Switching gears just a little bit. So a couple months ago, I saw a documentary on Netflix called The Social Dilemma. The topic was basically social media platforms and how they can become very unhealthy. But they brought up an interesting point. The human brain has evolved slowly over millions of years, while AI is evolving exponentially. So what would you say to those who think that AI might someday outsmart or overtake the human race? Yeah, fascinating question, especially for a CFO interview, but it happens <laughs> to be one that, uh, that, that you know, I've, I've put some thought into over the years. And you know, I think at a certain level of abstraction, we're already augmented by AI. Right, we have these phones in our pocket, these mobile computers. It's, it's actually strange we call them phones. They're, they're incredibly powerful computing devices. And we rarely use them for their, their phone functionality, but that's an aside. They're literally an extension of ourselves today. They're an extension of our minds. They augment our intelligence. Think about any time you want to understand what product a company sells or, or where the optimal sort of path to get from A to B. We use our phone, we, we, we type it in. And that extends our intelligence in very real ways. However, just like I said, you type it in. The, the problem today, and the reason we don't think of it as, as, as a being augmented by AI today is that the data rate or the bandwidth is very slow. You know, it's, it's effectively as fast as we can type with our, with our thumbs or increasingly speak to some kind of AI assistant that's, that's uh, software running on the phone. But, but nonetheless, it's a pretty slow bandwidth. It's a bad interface. And I think that we'll see really dramatic improvements in bandwidth in this context over the next few years, if not maybe five or 10 years. Projects like you know, Elon Musk's Neuralink, for example, are aimed at exactly this kind of problem. And I, I'm really excited for the applications here and also in, in a wide range of other contexts. So with that, like as background, I think we're on this path, this, this evolution that and you're right to say, like biologically, biological evolution takes place on a scale that is almost unfathomable to, to the human mind, right? It's such a long scale over which evolution takes place biologically, but technologically it's happening extremely fast. And so I think that practically speaking, we're only evolving technologically. And if you consider that today, these mobile computers are augmenting our intelligence, that's a form of how we're evolving and that will eventually merge, I think will become ever more dependent on these, these machine intelligence augmentations. And we'll eventually reach a point where we merge with these machines, with these artificial intelligences that gradually and continuously and increasingly augment our intelligence. And I'm reminded here of, of, a, of a book I read many years ago by a scientist, Ray Kurzweil, who you probably know, famous inventor and, and innovator and just big thinker in this domain. And his book was called The Singularity is Near. And for Ray, the, the singularity was the point at which human intelligence completely merges with machine intelligence, where we literally be, become capable of uploading our consciousness into a digital network. And I think that when that time comes, that will be kind of when the AI right, takes over, but, but we will fundamentally be part of the equation, uh, except for those, of course, who, who opt out. And, and I think that uh, they'll be left behind in a very dramatic way. But again, it's not going to happen all at once. There's going to be this gradual sort of merger that, that takes place over, over many years. Crazy to think about. So what would you say to those who might be scared that AI or automation might someday put them out of their job altogether? I would go back to a thought I shared earlier, which was that within the back office of live person, for example, we've deployed a lot of automation. And to, to an extent, that, that saved us costs in the form of headcount and avoiding additional headcount as we continue to scale. However, I think it's also done something really important. It's removed the repetitive, mundane transactional activities from the table for a lot of people. And I, I think that that allows people to, to have a more rewarding job, to, to lean in on, on what humans are innately very good at you know, what their minds are, are uniquely capable of relative to machine intelligence today. And that's the being creative and, and strategic with, with information. And that's, I think, something that, that will continue to change the way we think about 
jobs, the way we think about doing work and the way employers think about hiring. You know, the, the more widespread AI is, the better off I think we'll all be as humans because the jobs we do will be more interesting and we'll be able to contribute more of what we're truly capable of. So I think it's a good thing. Of course, like with any technology, it's there'll be disruptions and there's a lot, I think, of pitfalls to, to, to navigate. But on the balance, I, I would expect it to be very positive for all types of workers. So now that we've established that AI and data aren't an evil villain, how is it that AI and data are being used as a force for good? Maybe I'll just kind of give a few examples that, that come to mind. So, so at Live Person, I mentioned this already, but we're giving people their time back and we're making interactions with brands for, for products and services that you depend on every day, conversational and easy and even delightful in some ways. And, and we're satisfying our innate desire to be conversational. You know, in a completely different context, I would say, you know, self-driving cars, which are in the news all the time, will eventually make roads safer and way more efficient, even though the, the, the media grasps onto these headlines. I saw one for, uh, for a Tesla just the other day, how the autopilot was on when, when it crashed into a police car that was, that was stopped. Yes, that happens. And, you know, like any technology, there are bugs and they get worked out and eventually it becomes maybe not foolproof, but pretty close to it. I think we're in that cycle right now, but, but you can see, you can see a place down the road where, where we've radically changed our infrastructure and, and commuting is more efficient and, and far, far safer. I think also there's, there are models being deployed in the government and even in, in the private space where we now have access to this increasingly digitized world, as I described earlier, and those models are looking for terrorism. They're, they're looking for you know, indications of terrorism, indications of fraud and other nefarious activities. And I think that they have leveled up our ability to defend ourselves as a society against those, the, those kinds of evils. And I think we'll take that, we'll take that a lot farther than, than we have today. And granted, there's, there's, again, a balance of strike because there's an infringement on on privacy, perhaps, and, and maybe bias in algorithms, which is a whole other topic. But there's uh, clearly a lot of good that can be brought to the world through using AI for that purpose. I think in the medical, con medical context, there's, there's a lot of really interesting advancements. You know, advances in, in computer vision today are helping the blind see, which I think is incredible. And robot surgeons, for example, to stay with the medical context, that they will eventually relieve our dependency on just a very few highly specialized doctors who can, who are the only ones that can perform a certain operation. So you, you reduce the waiting list and, and save lives. So I think there's a lot of really interesting applications for AI across literally every domain that, that we'll see become more and more commonplace in the future. And what sort of tools or technologies are you seeing that are driving the most value in the AI slash data realm? Well, at a very general level, I would say, again, sticking with, with an earlier theme, we're just producing a lot more data today as a society globally than we did even just a few years ago. It's the, the pace of, of data production is exponential. And of course, for, for any, any learning algorithm, whether it's a simple classical machine learning algorithm or, or we're talking about deep neural networks, which are kind of all the rage today, all of those require lots of data to, to, to become truly robust. And so data generally, I think, and, and the pace at which we're, we're quantifying the world is probably driving the most value. And then on top of that, I would say deep neural networks have evolved dramatically. And, and I'm no expert in that level of, of machine learning. I've, I've dabbled and deployed models in the, in the more, more classical machine learning space. But deep neural networks have really changed the way we think about what's possible with machines and AI. And I think, you know, live person uses a, a, a DNN today for its natural language understanding models. And, and I think we'll continue to see really radical advancements in that domain as, as uh, we continue to push the boundaries. And you've already spoken to this, but I'm not sure if maybe you have anything else to add, but can you talk to us about the growing role of conversational AI in customer care, marketing, and sales? Sure. Well, maybe I'll give a, a different example than what I what I spoke on before. You know, in, in the fourth quarter, we signed a deal 
seven figure deal, uh, enterprise deal in, in a record 11 days for us. And it had nothing to do with messaging per se. And it had nothing to do with the contact center, which is kind of where our roots are in customer care. And it was really driven by, at a certain level of abstraction, AI as a service and our vision for what AI could be. And which is inherently humans conversing and being surprised and delighted by their experience, their interaction with an AI. And that vision we had, coupled with the real foundational technology that, that we built in that domain, allowed us to win that deal. And, and it was effectively for an AI guided COVID 19 test taking experience in the home, where within 15 to 20 minutes, you have results and you can submit them to a network, right? That's also part of the, the value proposition we've built for a health pass. So you can go back to the office or meet friends and, and, and coworkers in, you know, physically face-to-face -face, like, like we used to before, before 2020. And so it brings a lot of good to the world. It helps restart the economy in, in many ways. And of course, uh, vaccines are doing that as well, but I think testing is a necessary component to that equation, to, to getting us all back, uh, acting like humans again and, and kind of ensuring that the economy gets back on, on solid footing. That's something that we helped to bring to the market that uh, was purely driven by our vision for conversational AI and the technology that, that we've developed and the extensibility of our platform to enable AI as a service. And, and we followed on there and actually and there's some PR out on this we signed a deal with, with Citigroup, the, the big bank, in order for them to use this service, which they are today, to bring their employees back to the office. And you know, we're talking thousands of employees. That's, uh, I think, a really compelling use case that is also a pretty significant extension from where we've operated in the past. And lastly, on a more personal note, uh, what's something that you'd like to accomplish, either professionally or personally, or maybe both, in 2021? Yeah, maybe I'll, I'll just stick with the theme and, and the live person. I mentioned when I first joined the organization before even taking on the CFO seat, you know, I set about to really change the way we think about the back office functions and all the data flowing through the back office. And, and it's, it's incredible value for driving decision-making and go to market and, and product development. And we've made a lot of progress there in, in bringing connecting systems, bringing data to the surface, transforming that data into information. And it's driving real value, real recurring value today. The next phase though, is, is something I hinted at earlier, which is to really democratize this data, democratize this information across the organization, increase this sort of, you know, create this kind of radical transparency in that regard that they put you know, put in the hands of, of all of our people the information to, as I said, be creative and strategic, to redefine even their own roles, because now they have all this new information at their disposal that could automate their own workflows if they've identified a, a bottleneck or some repetitive workflows that, that they want to, to get rid of instead of relying on a central organization to, to do that work for them. And the key to unlocking this, though there are a few, but the, the one we have yet to, de, to develop and deploy is this layer of, of conversational AI, which of course is our core technology, but we need to add it to the data management architecture, the, the data lake architecture that we've built out and the self-service tools that, that we've built such that employees across the organization can, can simply ask for or about a particular domain or, or, or function and get all the information that the company has at their fingertips without writing a, a single line of code. And I think when we're able to do that and we couple it with uh, what we've already deployed, which is kind of a self-service, no-code way to build dashboards and, and reporting and, and even interactive systems that, that can automate workflows, then I think we'll, we'll reach a level of sophistication and, and progress in, in, in evolving the back office functionality that's uh, like really something Rob and I had envisioned from the start. And so that's, I think that's realistic in 2021 and uh, I'm very excited to, to see it happen. John, this has been a truly fascinating conversation. Thank you so much for joining me today. Thank you. It was, uh, it was fun and, and I appreciate the uh, diversity of questions here. Yeah, I've enjoyed speaking with you and hearing about your experience. And thank you so much for giving us insight into the importance of AI and how it's changing accounting, business in general, and really the world overall. I Great. Wish well, thanks again. 
yeah, I wish you and my person the best this year and in the future. And to all of our listeners, I hope you've enjoyed this episode as well. Please tune in next week. And until then, take care of yourselves. If you're ready to boost efficiency and streamline your accounting processes at significant cost savings, it's time to talk with Personiv. Their people-powered solutions have transformed the delivery of back office tasks and general accounting functions for decades, partnering with clients to provide everything from accounts payable to payroll services. See what Personiv can do for you by visiting personiv.com. You've been listening to CFO Weekly presented by Personiv. Please subscribe wherever you get your podcasts to hear all of our episodes. Want to learn more? Check out personiv.com. Thanks for listening.